We continue with the book of Leviticus and today is session number 6. And as we've worked through the first 10 chapters, we now get to chapter 11 of Leviticus. And this is all about the kosher and the unkosher animals. And as we've discussed in detail more than enough times in the past, it's also about a kosher and an unkosher lifestyle. And kosher and unkosher choices. And it's not just as simple to say, um, it's, it's, is it really about you know, what you're putting into your mouth? Kosher lifestyle is a choice. It's a belief system. It is a lifestyle. It's not just one or two things you change. The moment you get to the point where you decide, according to the word of God, that changes your perception and that goes in against everything you've learned all your life, the moment you get to that choice where you turn away from unkosher animals, do not eat them anymore, and you turn to only eating what God has created as food. That is a pivotal point in a believer's life. The rest of the, I, I, don't, I can't say it's easy, but there's, there's a lot of other choices that is quite easy to change. Um, the most difficult ones for most believers is this one, to change your eating habits, to change what you put into your mouth and what you don't. And because that is something that you take action with in, in the physical, your action in the spiritual had to proceed that. You first had to go through the process of having your, your traditions changed, seeing the light and the truth, deciding to follow that path. And as you follow the path, slowly but surely, physically, in your reality, in your day-to-day -day life, your behavior and your lifestyle changes. So you yourself know how long have you been a believer before you got to the point where you realized you can no longer eat pork and shellfish and prawns and all those nice things that the world says we can eat. That is almost like a like a proving point that that you are totally convinced that the kosher lifestyle, the holy lifestyle, the covenant lifestyle is what you want to do. And to change this specific thing in your life is really um, it's an it's like an explosion that happens in your life. And everything before this period, before this decision, you can actually see as your path of coming out of Egypt. And the moment you make this decision, your life forward is under the cloud, inside the covenant, being called out, being Ecclesia, being the church, being Israel, and continuing to follow the cloud, the presence, the fire, the Ark of the Covenant through the wilderness. So the kosher lifestyle choice, it takes for some people a very long time to get to this. And for some people it's quick. In my own life, when, when I realized the moment I heard about kosher eating and I studied these verses, we stopped. We stopped with, with all the, the bacon. We loved bacon and eggs in the morning. We loved it. But we already left the church system. We stopped the Sunday worship. We, we stopped the Christmas and Easter celebrations. So by the time we got to this pivotal decision, it wasn't actually so difficult. And uh, as we studied this in the past, um, you also know that it's not only about what goes into your mouth, as Yeshua teaches in the New Testament. It's really about what goes into your heart, what you allow in your heart. Because it's what's born in the evil thought in the heart that brings out something worse than putting a piece of pork in your mouth. And a kosher lifestyle is not only about the physical eating, but more about the spiritual eating. And then, of course, about what that spiritual food does inside of you. <sighs> Having an angry thought and an evil thought um, is also unkosher. So it's not only about food. This is so much deeper. 
But you know this because we have discussed this in detail during many of the previous sessions, especially the one where we compare the experience Peter had on the roof in Acts 11. And uh, yeah, coincidentally, it's Leviticus 11 that talks about kosher and unkosher. And if you've done um, these studies with me this far, you know exactly what I'm talking about. And if you don't know yet what God meant when he said to Peter on the roof, um, Peter, slaughter and eat. And Peter said, no, I've never uh, eaten anything that's an abomination to you. And I never will. If you don't understand yet what that conversation is about, um, just WhatsApp me or email me, bible at twotreesinthegarden.co.za. And that is a number two. And uh, I'll, I'll help you with those studies. So chapter 11, we're not going to read verse by verse. Chapter 12 to chapter 15, we are not going to read verse by verse. But you know, you have to, at your own time, go through those chapters so that you can indeed read through the whole Bible, everything from the beginning. Don't skip anything. But um, yeah, chapter 12 to 15 is about uh, motherhood, all the laws and regulations about motherhood. Beautiful. You can find a lot of treasure there for yourself. We've discussed most of, most of this in previous, so that's why I'm not going through it verse by verse. We discussed the laws of leprosy. We discussed all the deep spiritual meaning of the cleansing um, rituals. So um, I now jump to chapter 16. And chapter 16 is about the Day of Atonement uh, called Yom Kippur. Yom is day. Kippur is to cover or atone for. So Yom Kippur is um, the Day of Atonement. It's one of the feasts that you start keeping when you make the decision to come into the kosher covenant lifestyle. We discuss the Day of Atonement of chapter 16 in detail for you showing you in perfect clarity and deep understanding the depths of mystery locked into this holy day. There are so many deep mysteries in the Day of Atonement in Yom Kippur. All the wondrous messianic symbolism, the rituals, the rites, and how Messiah can never be understood in the same light ever again once you've studied and understand Yom Kippur. The study is approximately two hours long. Um, it's in two sections. Um, and I've done this study for you. It's also on the YouTube link. Again, email me, bible at twotreesinthegarden.co.za or you can just go on to um, um, the website of twotreesinthegarden.co.za and you click on the YouTube link, you go to playlist, look for biblical feast days and look for Yom Kippur and work through that verse by verse. Old and New Testament cross references all over the place showing an understanding the messianic importance in this day of atonement. We will therefore not discuss chapter 16 verse by verse. I now go to chapter 17 and uh, this is repeating the instructions regarding that there's only one place for sacrifice. And in chapter 17 there's a lot of discussions regarding the fact that life is in the blood. So all these important things about Jerusalem, about the temple, um, about life that's in the blood. We discussed it, you'll remember, you go through whole, the whole of chapter 17. I just want to highlight um, um, verse 7 of chapter 17. They shall no more offer their sacrifices unto devils. So a lot of people say that demons... And stuff wasn't really a lot in the Old Testament. It's more in the New Testament. I don't agree with that at all. Demons was only um, more talked about in the New Testament. The Old Testament prophets, you know, didn't, didn't write about this a lot. They wrote about it enough. God talks about this enough for us to understand that um, Satan and demons and devils and angels and all these things has been a part of Earth's history from the beginning. And here in Leviticus 7, God specifically says, they shall no longer offer their sacrifices unto devils. So that means they were sacrificing unto devils, unto demons, unto idols, because of behind every idol there is a demon. Um, and God says part of his covenant lifestyle is you will only sacrifice to me and you'll only sacrifice in the place where I say you sacrifice, where I call out my name as the whole chapter 17 teaches. 
um, he says the reason why you don't sacrifice unto devils because that is whoring he says in verse 7 they shall no more offer their sacrifices unto devils after whom they have gone whoring this shall be a statute forever unto them throughout their generations so again we we have highlighted this so many times it's not only about satan worshippers or satanism to sacrifice unto devils just to eat at the table of um to have stuff on your table that is against the will and the torah of yahuwah the almighty god that you worship just to mix your own table you're already eating at the table of demons just to mix your religion and have a feast day that has its root in uh, paganism is devil worship it sounds horrible i know it, it how can you how can you tell somebody that doesn't understand satan claus is satan and brought the sun god's birthday into the church and and deceiving the whole world to think that yeshua was born on the same day as all the sun gods of pagan history they they are loving people and how do you explain to them that they are sacrificing to devils but yet god speaks to his own people he's not condemning them he's not telling them they're going to go to hell he's he's not um pushing them away neither does he with people today he just says from now on you will stop it look at verse 17 from now on they shall no longer offer sacrifices unto devils because now i've taught you the difference between the way of the tree of life and the way of the tree of knowledge of good and evil the way of the light the way of the darkness now that you can distinguish between the two ways and you choose the kosher covenant way you will no longer offer to idols or to to devils or to demons you will stop with those practices and then you come into my covenant and and i put your previous sins under the atonement blood and i make you my people and i'll be your god so it's just a matter of being educated by the torah the torah is the instruction manual of the children of god we send our children to school they get instruction manuals on how to do mathematics or whatever and they have to follow those instructions um, step by step otherwise they cannot do mathematics and one day they can't even work out their own budget so there's there's a very good reason for children of god that wants to be educated to allow the instruction manual of god to educate us and we know this instruction manual became flesh especially for us to show us it's not so difficult you can do it i will give you the strength i will show you the way i will teach you how the laws of my father is to be fulfilled matthew 5:17 so uh leviticus 17 says we will no longer offer sacrifices unto devils exodus 22 verse 20 he that sacrifices unto any other god besides yahuwah alone he shall be utterly destroyed so if you don't hearken or listen if you don't shema to the instruction that says you must stop it and you continue doing it unfortunately you will be utterly destroyed and here i just remind you god says you will be utterly destroyed god doesn't say you will burn in hell forever again just follow the steps email whatsapp go to the website there's a whole discussion regarding what happens when we die what is heaven and hell what what is the eternal judgment what is this destruction that god is talking about and don't be deceived some people even believe us i know i know people right here in my area that uh, of staunch churchgoers and they've got buddha statues in their house don't be deceived having a statue of another god in your house or any of these kinds of things that lots of christians thinks are harmless because well i don't bow down to them i don't worship them 
You don't really understand how deceived you are. Why? Well, I don't know. Let's ask Paul. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 10 verse 20, But I say that the things which the Gentiles sacrifice, they sacrifice to devils and not to God. And I would not that you should have fellowship with devils. So Paul says that when Gentiles sacrifice to their idols, they're actually sacrificing to devils. God says in Leviticus 17, you will stop your sacrifices unto devils. Because they had statutes. Um, all these pagan gods always have statutes. Um, so if both God in Leviticus 7 and Paul in Corinthians confirm, and God in Exodus 22, if they confirm that there are devils and demons behind idols and statutes, then we have to wake up. Don't give the lame excuse that it's just an ornament. Um, if, if I bow to it, yes, then you can say that I'm devil worshipping, but I'm not bowing to it. But don't use that excuse. Um, you, you, can't, you can't worship God and have a pagan statue with a demon beside it or behind it or in it. I don't, I don't even know. You can't have that in your house. How many people have argued with me in the past? It's just a piece of wood or it's just a piece of rock or it's a gift. Somebody gave it to me that went to visit India and they brought this gift back to me. It's just a statue of an elephant with eight arms. It's not a demon. I'm not worshipping it. I don't care. No idols. And it's not me that says so. It's the Bible. It's your God. The enemy is just too clever and he has planted his demons in every possible open door that we as humans will give him. And that goes for tattoos as well. So many idolatrous figures are tattooed on Christians these days. So many idolatrous clothing brands, pictures in the children's rooms, etc, etc. You know what I'm talking about. Please don't accuse me of seeing the devil behind every door or seeing the devil behind every rock. Because I have a problem. And my problem is that I do see the devil behind every door. Because he is flipping behind every door. He is especially behind the doors that we leave open. The only door that he is not behind. The only door he will do everything in his might to keep you away from. Is the door of the tent of meeting. The door that leads towards the tabernacle, Yahshua, the door that leads to the presence of Yahuwah. The rest of the doors, my friends, stay away from them. Let's jump to Leviticus chapter 18 and you read through it verse by verse. And this is all about sexual sin and all the sexual prohibitions and instructions and what you can do, what you can't do, blah, blah, blah. There's a lot. We have discussed this, I think, more than enough during the Torah studies. But I just want to highlight verse 3 to 5. Amidst all the perversion of this world, all the whoring, the physical whoring, the spiritual whoring, verse 3 to 5 is the way we walk after we repented of physical and spiritual whoring, um, whoring and, and perversion and, and sexual sins. Leviticus 18 verse 3 to 5. After the doings of the land of Egypt wherein you dwelt, you shall not do. And after the doings of the land of Canaan, where you are going, shall you also not do. Neither will you walk in their ordinances. Alright, so God is clear. We don't do the this, this, this stuff that Egypt is doing because we came out of Egypt. God brought us out. We are on our way to the promised land, but the promised land is full of Canaanites and they've got they, their own system of worship with all their own perversions and idolatry and sacrifices and um, um, sexual sins. And you don't do after the way that they are doing. No. Verse 4 of Leviticus 18. Um, on the one hand, we've got Egypt and on the other hand, we've got Canaan. And both of them are part of Babylon. Both of them, at the end of the day, worship the same sun god, son of God, Lucifer, that, that 
is the Antichrist that portrays himself as if he is the Son of God. Born, you know all these traditions now, he's the false one. And whether you worship him like the Egyptians before a statue of Ra, or you worship him like the Canaanites before a statue of Zeus, or any of the other false religions in between, all the way up to today, where the Roman Catholics today still bow before the sun god, that statue whom they call Jesus, look at it, see the symbolism, compare it to the pagan idols and statues, and you'll see how it's portraying the same sun god from the beginning. Uh, if you don't know what I'm talking about, please just email me so I can give you the details. But amidst all of this, between Egypt and Canaan, we are now in the wilderness. We are being set apart, pulled to one side, pulled out of Egypt, not being allowed to mix with Canaan. We are separate. And God says, don't walk after Egypt. Don't walk after Canaan. But, verse 4, you shall do my judgments. You will keep my ordinances. You will walk in my Torah. Because I am Yahuwah, your Elohim. You shall therefore keep my statutes and my judgments. Because if you do them, you will live. I am Yahuwah. This is how we walk. We can't mix with those lots of people or those traditions or those paganism or those deceptions anymore. But we can neither mix with these people and their paganism and their false doctrines and their deceptions anymore. We have to walk on this very thin, narrow road in between. Like God says to Joshua, don't turn from this narrow road to the left or to the right. Stay on this road. Okay, um, let me just also uh, highlight for you Leviticus 18 from verse 6 to 20. And read about this all for yourself, but it's basically the summary of the seventh commandment. You shall not commit adultery. And we have dealt with each of these individually during the Torah studies. And here God explains in detail, just in case anybody wants to claim ignorance. You remember ignorance? What was that word? Chacha something. What did we talk about when we talked about ignorance? Where is that word in the Hebrew? Do you remember? Um, ignorance in Hebrew is shechacha. There we go, shechacha. So even if you want to claim ignorance one day, it's going to be difficult because God actually deals with each individual sexual sin and every possible way in which you can transgress his law in detail. In, uh, in chapter 18. Um, to say that you didn't know, uh, it's going to be quite difficult. L um, we, we have to understand ignorance is not going to be a good enough excuse. No adultery with a family member or in-laws. No fornication with children, obviously. Grandchildren, obviously. Yeah, we think it's obvious, but God still had to list all of this in these, in these verses. No fornication with stepchildren, aunts, uncles, neighbors, men sleeping with men, women sleeping with women, or having, or having sexual perversion with animals. None of that. He, ha he lists them verse by verse. Leviticus 18 verse 24. Defile not yourself in any of these things. Why? Because the rest of the nations defile themselves with us. All these things the nations do. No wonder that the Jerusalem, uh, Jerusalem Council in um, Acts 15, no wonder that they instructed all the pagan people, all the heathen people that were busy turning back to God to stay away from idol temples. Because you can imagine the sexual perversion. I told you actually, you don't have to imagine. We, we handled this various times in the past. All the sexual perversions that were going on at the temples. And all the, of course, the, the, the unkosher eating and, and uh, celebrations and sacrifices and stuff. God clearly says, don't sleep with anyone but your spouse, your, your own married partner. The one that God chose for you. The one that God sent across your path. 
no matter how difficult that person, that man or woman is. The man or woman of your youth that you fell in love with. Because having intimacy with the one you love and no other, that is the foundation of God's relationship with His church. So the new Gentile believers were instructed. God wants His people out from the heathen nations, not doing what Egypt does, not doing what Canaan does, not mixing with the Egypt or Canaanite temples that was still in the area where Jerusalem was, even in the time of the New Testament. And the Jerusalem council, James and those guys, said, said to the, the heathens and the pagan people, and to this the words of the prophets agree. Because why? God wants to keep his people close to his heart, away from this idolatry, away from the adultery, away from perversion. So the Jerusalem council says that all of this, um, the words of the prophets agree. So the Jerusalem council in the New Testament knew all the prophets in the Old Testament. And they knew all the prophecy of the Old Testament. They talk about one of those prophecies because now the Jerusalem Council is, is trying to figure out what to do with the pagans that, is, that, that are babies, that now is just for the first time coming out of paganism and turning onto the covenant way. And, and James um, convinces the rest of the believers that what's happening here with these pagans turning to God is written in the prophets. Acts 15 verse 15, and to this agree the words of the prophets as it is written. After this I will return, I will build again the tabernacle of David, which has fallen down. And I will build again the ruins of the tabernacle, and I will set it up. This is a promise by God. This is a verse that you can use when you pray. God promised he will build up the tabernacle of David again. He continues in verse 17, so that the rest of men might seek after Yahuwah, so that all the Gentiles can seek after Yahuwah. All the Gentiles upon whom my name is called, says Yahuwah. So this is how God himself, through Messiah, the personification, the manifestation of God on earth, how he built the tabernacle. Every pagan that turns out of every tribe, nation and tongue that gets the seed of the truth starting to grow inside of him, when he turns back to Yahuwah, he is another living stone of the tabernacle that Yahshua is being built, is busy building up again. And um, James continues in verse 18. Know unto God, known unto God, are all his works from the beginning of the world. Because what was happening here in the New Testament with these pagans coming out from Egypt, out from Canaan, out from um, the Roman and the Greek mythology and, and uh, false worship, as they were coming out, this is what, what God's work was from the beginning. From Genesis 1, that's why God said to Adam and Eve, do not listen to the serpent. Do not eat his words. Do not desire the, the mystery of the knowledge of the tree of knowledge because it's not mystery any way. It's not knowledge anyway. I have the mysteries and I have the knowledge for you. But you have to eat from the tree of life. It's the only tree you can eat from. So from the beginning, this work of God is known to you and me, known to the Jerusalem council, known to Moses. That's why the Old Testament, the New Testament, and me and you today, we agree. We come out of, these, of this paganism because this is the, the will of God, that the Gentiles will return to him. Over the ages, millions of Gentiles have turned unto Yahuwah. I was a Gentile. I turned unto Yahuwah. And the moment you turn unto him and you come through that one door where Satan is trying to keep you away from, when you come through that one door into the tabernacle and you learn everything about the kingdom and the tabernacle of God, that is the day that you change from being a Gentile to becoming Israel, 
every Gentile that ever joined Israel and got circumcised and started keeping the Sabbath days were called children of God. They were divided up into one of the twelve tribes and they will enter the new Jerusalem one day by one of the twelve gates. Known unto God are all his works from the beginning of the world. Therefore, James continues, my sentence is, don't trouble them, those that from the Gentiles turn to God, but write to them that they abstain from pollution of idols, like we saw now in Leviticus um, 17 and Exodus 22, that they um, abstain from fornication, like we saw now in, in Leviticus 18, and that they stay away from things strangled. Um, we've, we've discussed all the um, kosher animals and how God wants us to offer to him kosher clean animals, but we also treat them in a kosher clean way. We don't strangle them like the pagans do. And that they will keep from blood, like we saw in, uh, what was it, Leviticus 17, the life is in the blood. So you can see everything that the Jerusalem Council, which the church claims is the New Testament church, and they are telling the Gentiles they don't have to keep the Torah of Leviticus. No, they only have to keep these four commandments and then they'll be fine. You know by now, we've discussed um, Acts 15 in detail before. Um, even in the book of Genesis, many, many moons ago, this is not at all what happened here. Because he continues anyway to say in verse 21, the rest of the Torah they can learn from Moses in every city that preaches Moses. In every synagogue that preaches Moses, every Sabbath day, they can learn the rest. But, but the one door where Satan is not trying to keep us away from, he's behind all the other doors. But the one door where he, where he cannot be behind because that door is Messiah. Satan has a false door that looks like Messiah. There is a way that looks right to men, but the end thereof is death. That's why we need to be instructed like children by the Torah. So we can recognize the door, which is Yeshua, the, the word of God himself. And that is how God will build up his tabernacle again. Idols and fornication and animal sacrifice and sexual sin with humans and animals and every child sacrifice. All these things the nations did. No time to go into the modern day child trafficking the drinking of adrenochrome by the top elite structure of the new world order or the beastly activities of the kings of this world. No time to go into that. But sexual sin with humans and animals and child sacrifices, these things have been going on since the beginning and still is today. I'm just reminding you, the holy people of God, that just as in the day of the book of Leviticus, so all of God's people must not join any institution or religion or government or organization in which these things are done in secret by the top structure and sometimes not even in such big secrets anymore on spiritual level all adultery and fornication is a code word for idolatry and being unfaithful to god whom i remind you is a jealous god a jealous husband and the one who will bring severe revenge on those from ancient pagan cultures up to today, who sacrifice, sexually abuse and murder children, animals, women and innocent people for their own gratification, or because they worship a demon god who is thirsty for these things and demand it. No time to go into the real reason behind planned parenthood or abortion or the legalization of abortion about 20 years ago. <laughs> Just to study these people that are doing these things and to see how they are part of the top elite world structure and where they get their money from and what their plans are with all these things. They call it pro-choice to make it sound so good. It's a choice every woman must have. <laughs> what is the real reasons? Who's the real people behind Planned Parenthood? Child sacrifices. Is still going on today. Yahweh spends all the time in Leviticus 18 from verse 1 to 30 to explain all the sick traditions of the pagans, not only the sexual sins but also the child sacrifices. He basically then interrupts himself in verse 21. He was talking about sexual sin from verse 6 to 20 and then suddenly out of the blue he talks about child sacrifice in verse 21 
And then he continues in verse 22 to the end of the chapter about sexual sin. All right? So, so the whole chapter is about sexual sin. But in the middle of the chapter, just one verse, he says, verse 21, You shall not let any of the seed of your seed pass through the fire to Molech. Neither shall you profane the name of Yahuwah. I am Yahuwah. So to talk about Molech worship today. Children being offered in the fire to Molech. <laughs> People will think you're crazy. People will call you a conspiracy theorist. They'll call you a radical anarchist. They'll call you somebody who's spreading sedition. But believe me, the kingdom of darkness today is no different to what it was at the Tower of Babel, at the Tree of Knowledge, during the time of the Nephilim insertion before the flood, or what is happening in the palaces and the temples of Egypt, Babylon, Chaldea, Canaan, eventually Greece, Rome, and still today in the palaces of the princes of this world. That is why God warns his people then and now. Leviticus 18 verse 27 For all these abominations have the men of the land done which were before you, and the land is defiled. The land don't do these things so that the land don't spew you out, vomit you out. When you defile it, because it spewed out the nations that were before you, whoever shall commit any of these abominations, even the souls that commit them shall be cut off from among the people. Therefore you shall keep my ordinances. You will commit not any of these um, abominable, <coughs> abominable customs which were committed before you, so that you don't defile yourselves therein. I am Yahuwah, your Elohim. I want to read to you the same verse, Leviticus 18 verse 28. In the King James, it says, The land will spew you out if you don't follow the Torah. Especially in this in this regard of child sacrifice and sexual sins, which has a spiritual application. It's not, you can't just wash your hands in innocence and say, I don't sleep around when you've got spiritual sexual sin. So um, King James says the land will spew you out. The TS 2009 says the land will, will vomit you out. And now I want to take you to Revelation 3.15. I know your works. You are neither cold nor hot. If only you were cold or hot. But now because you are lukewarm, because you cannot choose the way of God and, uh, or the way of the world, because you're lukewarm, you're not cold or hot, I will vomit you out of my mouth. The Holy Land and Yeshua will vomit all of those, all the all those that can't choose today whom you will serve. Joshua said, you choose today whom you will serve, but I choose Yahuwah, me and my family. All those that cannot choose Yahuwah to follow his way. Don't do Egypt. Don't do Canaan. Don't do Rome. Don't do false sun god traditions. Come out of that. Be glorious and holy and, and, uh, and sanctified to me. If not, the land will spew you out. I will spew you out.